Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, at today's today's panel uh, on unleashing innovation in agriculture to deliver deliver climate solutions. Uh, this is this is part of the International Chamber of Commerce's Make Ag Climate Everyone's Business uh, Conference alongside the, the COP26 meetings. So I hope those of you that have been following this virtual event for the last uh, last 10 days have, have found it informational. And I, I hope those of you that are that are physically present in, in Glasgow have likewise um, found those to be productive discussions. Uh, so my name is uh, John McMurdy. I am uh, the Vice President for Innovation and Development at, at CropLife International, and I'm going to be your moderator for, for today's, uh, today's session. So just quickly, at CropLife International, we are a, we're an industry association that, that represents the, the plant science sector globally um, on issues of, of international concern, like climate, of course, and working with sister CropLife associations that are active in, in more than 90 countries. The, the topic today really is, is going to look at the, those kinds of partnerships, uh, investments, commitments, and approaches around innovation that, that really can ensure that agriculture delivers on climate solution and climate solutions and does so in a way that doesn't sacrifice productivity or farmer profitability. And I think today's session and panelists will, will touch a little more heavily on some of these topics, including in particular talking about the soil part of the equation. So the structure uh, today, we're going to start in a moment with, with opening remarks and uh, reflections uh, from, from uh, our CEO, Julia Di Tommaso. Uh, then we'll have a, a short pre-recorded presentation uh, by, by Dr. Ratan Lal, uh, followed by three panelists, uh, Mr. Tony Siantonis, um, Mrs. Ms. Kushbu uh, Singh Salvage, and Dr. Jim Barmhart. And I will uh, give some, some intros to them when we get there. Uh, just to, to note as we go here uh, that uh, any um, we will be collecting uh, uh, questions uh, for the, the speakers and the panelists. Um, and, and for those, you can just use the uh, comment section on the uh, right side of the, the hop in platform uh, here. And I will I will uh, uh, sift through those uh, as we get to that point in our in our session. So uh, with those uh, remarks, uh, maybe I can uh, initially turn it over to, uh, to our CEO and, and my boss, Julia uh, Di Tommaso, for her opening remarks. So Julia, over to you. Thank you so much, John. And I'm so pleased to, to be here today and provide some introductory comments and to welcome our panel of distinguished guests. And I would like to thank them for, uh, for their time. And I would like also to, to start by saying as COP26 uh, draws to uh, uh, a close this week, I, I was thinking that would be interesting to share and reflect on some of the highs. Uh, for me, some of the highs have been um, observing how for over a decade, business leaders have been advocating for a more inclusive, a collaborative approach to address uh, the climate change challenges. And in the opening remarks at the COP26 last week, we, we heard global leaders and NGOs were increasingly sharing the same views that is not about sectors or about conflicting interests, is really about working side by side and acting together to deliver the climate change solutions for today and for, for tomorrow. These, these commitments are very important and align with our purpose and vision at CropLife International to advance innovation in agriculture for a sustainable future and how by working together with all the key stakeholders, we can collectively play a key role in uh, leading towards uh, sustainable food systems. I observed an increased emphasis on carbon emissions reporting, on finance for supporting developing countries, the improvements of the uh, in risk disclosures uh, uh, this week, and also an increased optimism, a welcome optimism, I would say, on the role of technology and innovation, which I believe point to significant opportunity to anchor 
agricultural innovation center stage in any future discussions. We also heard a lot about addressing climate change for the future generation. And agriculture is a great example of the importance of the intergenerational journey from father to sons, and today, hopefully, to daughters too. And ag as agriculture really plays a critical role in our lives, it's the foundation of whatever we do, our families, our careers, our lifestyles. So, so this is the reason why we are here today. And today, webinar, I think it's very important because if we want to succeed in achieving the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement and the challenges, the opportunities beyond COP26, agriculture innovation is key. And in our view, innovation extends well beyond R&D and specific technologies. It's also about social in innovation. It's also about ideas generation and how we approach collaboration. And we know our members who are some of the world's largest agriculture R&D uh, companies are, only f are always fully committed to drive innovation through partnership and collaboration. The reality, we know that the opportunities and challenges ahead of us are simply to be, to be met by one company or by organizations alone. But how do we go about that? In our work in uh, as supporting the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, we are working with our members towards a global shared ambitions of zero hunger, carbon neutrality, and natural positive solutions. And when we talk about innovation in this sector, this is something very tangible and dynamic, and sometimes involves stakeholders who have not work together in the past. It means industry scientists and young scientists working together with both new uh, and existing partners to develop drought tolerant varieties of crops. It's game changing tech, which is emerging to support farmers on the ground through digital precision agriculture. It's drones moving around the farms to support the farmers to determine how much crop protection is needed. It's all about doing more with less natural resources. And this is just the beginning of a very exciting journey. But the clock is ticking, we know, and post COP26, uh, all the barriers need to come down. We need to focus on innovation and also on greater acceleration or collaboration and partnership and coalition to achieve the necessary scale, reach and impact. And at Crop Life International, we continue to champion an inclusive approach, coalition approach. We have recently joined a coalition of action on sustainable productivity growth for food security and resource conservation which will focus on the role of innovation and agriculture play in uh, addressing the productivity challenge for a growing population. It's a coalition that brings together a multi-stakeholder group and sharing the uh, same belief of how we can address the productivity challenge in a more holistic approach. We are also proud to have been announced as uh, uh, innovation spring partner this week for the agricultural innovation mission for climate change for climate aim for c which is a joint international coalition championed by the united states and united arab emirates and other relevant uh, key stakeholders uh, by joining together and aiming and accelerating investment in sustainable agriculture for food systems transformation. And at Crop Life International, we will work through the coalition as a spring partner to encourage a more 
um, uh, more access to smart to climate smart solutions for smallholder farmers uh, through our sustainable pesticides management framework uh, program which, in, which co um, foresees an investment of 13 million us dollar for the next uh, six, six years we recently also joined um the, we have working with other we catalyzed uh, an an yes, interesting group of stakeholders around the soil health coalition as we know so important as we can address collectively the soil health uh, component of the sustainable agricultural path uh, estimating that soil health contributes to 25 percent of the world biodiversity and finally in terms of partnership i would like also to remind our support to the climate makers uh, and we joined the initiative since uh, COP24, and this group, uh, working together with the World Farmers Organization, has done a tremendous work to support and elevate the voice of the farmers uh, and to highlight the importance of agriculture uh, at the center stage. So we know all this area is not without challenges and challengers, but we see uh, how this uh, is coming together, how we are working and listening to other stakeholders, how we can collectively de deliver on sustainable food systems. We would like to continue to work and, of course, to continue to engage with this group. Uh, and as uh, COP26 now close to, uh, to an end, um, I, I would like to say that personally, I remain an impatient optimist that beyond COP26, agricultural innovation will take center stage in accelerate the response to climate change. There's no other way. Thank you very much. And I look forward to our discussions and debates uh, today. Thanks, John. And back to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Julia. That's that's wonderful to, to set the stage for the rest of our conversation today. Um, I, I will say, um, I think um, some of these new initiatives Julia mentioned on um, sustainable productivity growth and the Ag Innovation Mission for Climate, we're certainly very excited about um, what opportunities that, that, that those can uh, deliver for, for agricultural um, broadly. So uh, wonderful. Thank you for that. So um, now we're going to move on to um, a very uh, brief uh, pre-recorded uh, presentation uh, by uh, by our, our our friend Dr. Ratan Lal. Um, if, you, if you don't know, uh, Dr. Lal is uh, he's a distinguished university professor of, of soil science at uh, at the Ohio State University here in the here in the United States, um, as well as the the founding director of the Carbon Management and Sequestration Center at uh, also at Ohio State University. Um, most recently, uh, he's uh, he's been awarded the, the World Food Prize in, in 2020 um, for his work really developing and mainstreaming soil centric approaches to increasing food production uh, while really focusing on on conserving natural resources and mitigating climate change. He's really one of the, you know, the strongest voices out there um, kind of helping us reflect and think about what, what we can achieve by focusing on agriculture um, in, in the climate change mitigation space, and in particular on the, on the soil piece. So um, with that, uh, why don't we turn uh, to our, our, uh, our short video from, from Dr. Lal here. I want to thank Michael Stebbing and Mr. Robert Hunter of Crop Life International for inviting me. The topic of my presentation is agricultural innovation as a climate solution, recarbonization of the terrestrial biosphere. Carbon stock in the atmosphere at the time of pre-agriculture, 10,000 years ago, was 360 gigaton. At the time of industrial revolution, circa 1750, it increased by 200 gigaton to 560 gigaton. And this increase primarily happened because of land use conversion and agricultural expansion. Since 1750 to 2020, the carbon stock in the atmosphere has increased by another 320 gigaton to 880 gigaton. This time, 
the difference is due to both land use conversion and agriculture plus fossil fuel combustion. Indeed, total emission from land use and agriculture since the beginning of agriculture 10,000 years ago is estimated at 575 gigaton. Total emission from fossil fuel emission since 1750 till today is estimated at 445 gigaton. So out of this total of almost 1100 plus gigaton, some has been absorbed by the atmosphere and increased by 520 gigaton, and some has been absorbed by ocean and the land itself. Therefore, putting carbon back in agricultural land and degraded land through innovative agriculture practices is a game-changing solution. Some of the innovative agriculture practices include conservation agriculture, regenerative agriculture, agroecology, agroforestry, integration of crops with trees and livestock, practices with positive soil, ecosystem carbon budget, and CNPK, C, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and other micronutrients through integrated soil fertility management. That means judicious combination of both organic and inorganic fertilizer, balanced use of plant nutrients, drip fertigation, digital agriculture and precision farming, artificial intelligence, drones, and robotics. Of course, improved varieties, which are very critical of this. The technical potential of carbon sequestration for all this at the present, if the improved agriculture practices are in soil alone, globally with improved agriculture practices, is about two and a half gigaton of carbon per year, ranging from 1.5 to 3.5, average of about 2.5. Between 2020 and 2100, the cumulative potential of carbon sequestration in soils of the world, 178 gigaton, and in vegetation, trees, woodlands, another 155 gigaton, total 333 gigaton, which has a drawdown potential of 157 parts per million of CO2. Therefore, if we adopt improved agricultural practices, which I gave some example, and at the same time find no carbon fuel sources, global warming below two degrees centigrade is still possible. Private sector, can make a very strong difference. One of the possibility of translating science into action by private sector in cooperation with government, public organization, and academic institution is to pay farmer for ecosystem services, societal value of carbon, which I estimate somewhere between 120 to $130 per ton, or C, which is about $35 per ton of CO2, Therefore, if a farmer sequester half a ton of carbon per hectare in soil or vegetation, they should be rewarded $65 per hectare, $26 per acre. If a land manager sequester one third of a ton, that's $43 per hectare, about $18 per acre. The UN Food System Summit came up with a coalition for action on soil health in their action track three, in which I was one of the person who proposed this concept. There are a few others. And this cash calls specifically for the establishment of a multi-stakeholder coalition, including private sector, to facilitate the adoption of scaling of soil health restoration practices with the outcomes of growth, productivity, rural livelihood, climate, and nature. In this regard, the private sector group coalition, PSDG coalition for soil health, support Soil Hub and the coalition by recognizing the need for private sector participation engagement, acknowledging tangible outcome related goals and solutions, highlighting the work that is being accomplished through existing initiatives and alliances, and emphasizing the need for science-based approaches and measurements. The long-term objective of CASH are many, I'll name few, number one, enhancing cooperation among multiple stakeholders, promoting on the ground adoption of best management practices, 
developing tools for measurement monitoring verification of soil health and its indicators, advocating a system-based soil health agenda, implementing an action plan for restoring soil health, developing a protocol for payments of ecosystem services, empowering farmers and land managers to adopt best management practices, strengthening human resource capital through promoting education, enhancing respectability of agriculture and soil health profession, alleviating drudgery of the farming of population through better agricultural practices. In this connection, one of my suggestions at the pre-summit was a mantra. And the mantra is healthy soil equal to healthy diet, equal to healthy people, equal to healthy ecosystem, equal to healthy planetary processes. Private sector has a major role to play in it. Thank you. Great, uh, a, a virtual thank you to, to Dr. Lal for, uh, for, for sending that along for us. Um, you know, I think what we can, we can take from that is that, you know, this is sort of the, the data backed piece of information on what we really can, can achieve um, by, by um, focusing on those, on those innovations to allow uh, some of those uh, solutions and outputs to come to, to fruition. So we, we certainly thank uh, Dr. Law from doing that and, and, and giving us um, a, a brief intro to the, the Coalition for Action on Soil Health, which we will, um, I believe our next uh, speaker will, um, will get into. So um, moving now into our, um, into our, our panel, our, um, our, uh, we're going to give uh, each of our, our speakers 10 minutes or so to, to, to speak, a, speak a little bit uh, openly, and then we will move to uh, questions and answers. Um, as noted before, please feel free to, to put those questions in the uh, comment box on the right of the tool here. Um, so uh, first panelist is, is uh, Tony Santonis. Um, Tony leads uh, the World Business Council on Sustainable Development's Scaling Positive Agricultural uh, Project, um, looking at how to achieve net zero, nature positive, and farmer-centered agricultural systems. Um, Tony's work for, uh, worked on climate change, agriculture, and, and sustainable development issues for, for more than 15 years, uh, working as an advisor in East Africa for the Ethiopian government, uh, as well as uh, for uh, in Europe for, for Deloitte, looking at sustainability and, and climate change strategies. Uh, so with that, maybe uh, over to you, Tony. Hopefully you can hear us okay. Yeah, thanks, John, and thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to Crop Life and the team for inviting me today, and of course for the continued participation that WBCSD is having uh, with, uh, with you and the rest of the group on things like the private sector guiding group of the uh, UN Food Systems Summit. Um, at WBCSD, um, we are a, a non-profit member company um, representing 200 members achieving the sustainable development goals. And uh, we, we launched earlier this year Vision 2050, which was our sort of vision for how you go from 2030 to 2050. And that was identifying three imperatives that we really believe business must be prepared to address in this space. Um, the challenges of the climate emergency, uh, the loss of nature and mounting inequality which of course have all been exacerbated by COVID. Um, global progress on this is still off target. You know, we're seeing sun come out of the COP, for example, about trying to get to what I was seeing yesterday about a 2.4 degree pathway, but still that's pretty disastrous. And business has a unique opportunity to contribute to the development of the frameworks and incentives that are gonna help us actually get to 1.5 degrees. Um, and we've, we're starting to see that come from COP. And, we really feel that soil health and um, is something which is fundamental to that. It brings together this climate and nature and people agenda um, in, in a way that very few other issues really do. Um, the way we're looking at this is saying that, you know, the health of our soil is a central part of the food system. We've heard this from um, Dr. Lal, who just spoke now. And um, there's an urgent need um, to accelerate investments um, from public and private sectors that are going to actually incentivize some of the changes needed here. Um, and what we're saying is that we believe soil health has incredibly um, valuable uh, returns on investment. Um, but the truth is at the moment that we don't actually think that 
um, this asset of soil is being looked after at a global level. Uh, when we see the levels of soil degradation, it is a huge risk to business continuity. Every year we're losing 75 billion tons of soil globally. That costs $400 billion per annum in lost agricultural production alone. And then soil and land degradation can cause agricultural commodity um, price volatility, um, declines in performance. Uh, you know, this is about nutrient loss and soil erosion is costing 33 to $60 billion a year. And that means that we're unnecessarily applying nitrogen and phosphorus and all, all sorts of other solutions into fields that, that don't necessarily need it. Um, so when I speak to the businesses we work with, we say that investing in soils provides an incredible return. It helps achieve um, the goals of productivity, business continuity through resilience, um, meeting corporate goals on net zero emissions, zero land conversion, and equitable farmer livelihoods. It has huge benefits here. <clears throat> but what we're seeing is that there's this big investment gap. And this is what I think, you know, it's been really important that Dr. Lal has been helping to drive behind. How can we start thinking about how to fill that gap? And what is it? I mean, when we look at it globally, a good proxy is the gap on, um, on biodiversity funding. Um, that's $800 billion, billion a year. Um, bridging that gap requires public and private sectors coming together to use financial instruments to make it happen. Um, and it can't be met by philanthropic um, funding alone. Um, and as of 2019, just $21 billion of private capital has flowed into these nature positive activities. And we believe that has to be much, much greater. So if we've got this gap and we've got this compelling business case, what we're saying is we have to find ways for companies to look at soils as an asset um, and secure investment into that. And, and to do that, what we have created in WBCSD is the, the Soils Investment Hub. Um, this has been a way to help companies integrate soil assets into corporate investment processes. Um, so in 2018, we published um, the business case for investing into soil health. We did it with many members across the value chain who are shared across um, many of you watching today. Um, showing the benefits, productivity, climate, water resources, biodiversity. And we've had a huge uptake of interest in this area since it's happened. Um, and so to really tackle this, we thought, well, we're going to bring together a soils investment hub that can help um, be a resource for knowledge and expertise and to connect business with existing platforms and initiatives and coalitions that can mobilize finance and engage with farmers um, and drive value chain collaboration. Um, and so there's there's three things that we've been looking at in this space. Um, the first one is a restoration roadshow uh, to mobilize business at the CEO level, to get CEO commitment of the importance of soils as an asset that demands investment. Uh, the second is the development of technical guidance that can help companies actually make the investments that they need to make. Um, and the third, and really importantly, is a, a Friends of Soil Health that comes together to bring together this multi-stakeholder dimension um, that we've seen come out of the UN Food System Summit and I'll touch on in a second. So this idea of a, um, a restoration roadshow. Um, so this is uh, companies at the C-suite level, CEOs committing to accelerating these investments and driving advocacy to unlock some of the changes that we need we need here. Talking about recognizing the value of soil, accelerating some of those investments. Um, the second is on the technical guidance work. Um, so what we've been doing is a lot to support companies to invest in impactful and high value long-term solutions for healthy soils and their supply chains. That requires companies to understand things like, look, what is the standardization of classifications of soil as a value chain asset? Um, how would you qualify and quantify and demonstrate the public and private benefits of those investments as much as possible across the environmental, the economic and the social dimensions? And also across different agricultural subsectors, uh, stages of the value chain, regions of the world. 
And ultimately, what we're, we're saying is we believe that that can help companies develop a portfolio of soil investment mechanisms that they can use to prioritize how they achieve um, healthy soils in their own way. And so we've helped companies to do that. Um, we've actually looked at um, investment um, case studies and commitments to date across uh, 16 companies. Um, we've got over 50 soil investment case studies. Uh, those are divided into about 12 specific um, mechanism categories. And what's great about that is that that's covering, um, if we add up all of those case studies, and those investments are going to about 56 and a half million farmers across the world. Um, a total investment across the companies that we're working with are of about 5 billion US dollars and covering 134 million hectares of land being managed. So, you know, we are seeing big numbers, but we believe that that's, that's not enough. We think that there's a lot more that can be done um, to continue to engage across these sectors and generate system-wide impacts. So the third area that I wanted to touch on um, is this piece about the Friends of Soil Health. It's like a, a soil health advisory group, if you like. Um, and what we've done here is said that um, there are many coalitions of action. A really important one has been this coalition of action for soil health that Dr. Atan Lau mentioned coming from the UN Food System Summit. And that has really been driving the multi-stakeholder approach. How do we bring governments, businesses, academia, civil society together to actually work out some of these solutions and how they get um, leveraged onto the ground? Um, and what we've, what we've been doing is convening a lot of those groups to help companies understand how they can patch into that landscape and also how to align some of the mutual goals and outcomes that we want to achieve here. Um, so we convene on a regular basis, a lot of uh, those groups coming together and um, to look at the technical standards and further develop uh, knowledge and expertise on the actions that are required here um, in the space. Um, and one of the things we've been chatting about is this idea that um, if, you, if for any of you working in the carbon uh, market space, you would have seen the, the LEAF coalition. That was a, a mechanism to leverage a billion dollars of investment across the public and the private sector um, into forest protection and restoration using the carbon markets. And that LEAF coalition was uh, with support the UK government, the Norwegians, uh, the US government, and going into critical, critical geographies of the world um, with many companies across the value chain who supported it. Um, what's really interesting about that is what could we do to create a LEAF coalition, but for soils? And you know, how can we continue to leverage important funds and mechanisms out there doing that? Things like the um, Land Degradation Neutrality Fund of the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, which is a critical convention for doing this, and indeed continuing to work with um, many of the partners on the Coalition of Action for Soil Health as well. So we're pretty excited about where this is going. Um, many companies engaged, uh, the input companies, off-takers of big agribusinesses and traders, many of the food brands who are investing upstream into their value chain to meet some of those uh, climate and nature and livelihood commitments I mentioned, and now really interestingly banks and investors who are getting into this. And we have this opportunity to use finance to leverage and incentivize that change as well, that even the, the, the finance which is going directly to farmers. Um, so going forwards, you know, what do we think is needed here? Well, we're going to continue to help all of our member companies and speed up their progress on mainstreaming investments into soil health. And um, we will continue working with partners like um, uh, CropLife International, and many others hosting these events to make that happen. Um, we think a lot more needs to be done. Um, on those investments. Land degradation is still causing billions of dollars of losses every year, as I mentioned. Um, best practice standards are really critical. Um, the Soils Investment Guidance Report that we're producing, this technical guidance I was mentioning, will be released on World Soil Day on uh, December the 5th. Um, and uh, I think on the standards piece as well, there's an important consideration for all of us, uh, carbon standards. You. We know that farmers are being offered lots of soil carbon sequestration opportunities out there by um, by companies. And those are using uh, many robust um, gold standard Vera um, examples of how that gets done. But there's still a lot of confusion within the grower industry out there as to how it can be adopted. And I think there's more that we can do as a business community to build trust 
um, especially with many of the farmers who are going to be undertaking these practices so that they can see that many of these schemes that they're signing into are actually going to give them the long term benefit and a fair return um, for, for what we've got here. So I think that's a lot of work of working with farmer groups that we really need to do to educate, build trust and, and bring more standards. So perhaps linking just into the next uh, speaker that I know is coming is that, you know, this COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated some of these existing pressures on the farming system. Um, I live on a farm, a family farm myself, and I, I see that, you know, evident day to day. Um, we hope that soil health can help mobilise financial resources for a more resilient food system, and, and that can be farmer centric. And um, those resources can really help. Um, and uh, yeah, we sort of saw uh, quotes from the Falcon website, you know, with their experience, farmers are the only ones capable of providing solutions to increase the adaptation of agricultural production to the direct effects of climate change, as well as finding solutions that contribute to the reduction of GHGs. And by pr protecting the environment and biodiversity, farmers protect themselves. And I think ultimately going forwards, farmers will be central uh, to all of the conversations that we have within the soil space. So thanks a lot for, uh, for the, letting me talk and happy to take questions later. Great, thanks, Tony. That's uh, fascinating stuff. A lot, uh, a lot of, of new information for me and I, I do already see a, a few uh, questions com coming in on that. Um, excellent. So, um, Please, again, if there's uh, questions on some of the, the soil related work that uh, Tony mentioned, please uh, pop them in the chat here. Uh, but uh, he gave us a, a nice uh, introduction to our to our next speaker, um, which uh, who uh, comes to us uh, from uh, Mauritius. Uh, Kushbu Seraj Singh uh, has been uh, practicing agricultural activities uh, since she was uh, 13, uh, really personally involved in farming activities. Uh, she's a uh, project coordinator of uh, FALCON that you just heard uh, Tony reference. I like this acronym, uh, Farmers in Agriculture, Livestock Cooperative and Organic Network uh, Association, um, and also the secretary of the FALCON uh, Young Farmers, uh, working towards the betterment of, of local farmer youth, uh, women, women uh, and the elderly, um, coupling with conservation of uh, the natural environment. Uh, and uh, Kushbu has also been part of the, the WFO uh, Climb Makers and uh, Gymnasium program. So I'm, I'm sure she'll share a, a bit about that. So uh, Kushbu, uh, over to you. Hopefully you can uh, hear us okay. Thanks a lot, John, for this uh, amazing introduction. Uh, I am uh, Kushbu Singh Sewaj, so a project coordinator at Falcon Association, which is based in Mauritius, and also a former secretary and now vice president of the Falcon Young Farmers here. So our, our association is mainly uh, strive to represent the local uh, voices of uh, farmers here in Mauritius to support them in their advocacy, uh, production and even marketing of their produce. So I will now uh, share a presentation just uh, uh, for you to have an idea how we here in Mauritius, being a small island, is in fact uh, engaging in, I would say, practices. It may be like seem a little mundane, but it's very effective for our region in order to be able to engage in green production here in Mauritius. So I'm sharing my screen. Yes. So I will be sharing some of the common practices. So before I uh, move on to the next slide, can someone please confirm if uh, my uh, slide is uh, moving? Is it okay, John? Yes, it looks good. Uh, nice and clear. Thank you. Yes. So, of course, uh, just like John mentioned, uh, I'm uh, the project coordinator of Hakon Association and also the Young Farmer at uh, World Farmers Organization in the uh, second edition of the World Farmers Gymnasium 2020-2022. It's a leadership uh, program, and I'm also an aspiring uh, local green policymaker. So below you will see my contact details in case you want to know more about Falcon Associations and our 
current activities here in Mauritius. So I'm sure many of you would agree that uh, all around the world in the farming sector, we are all facing common current roadblocks to the green practices, especially in times of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I would like to share with you some of the main uh, uh, points involving connecting, sorry, agriculture, climate change, and now, of course, the COVID-19 situation. So we've seen that there are uh, frequent flash floods that have led to major consequential loss of farm produce and also economic damage for farmers. There are irregularities in the rainfall patterns that have led to even high competition for water that are directed uh, to agriculture, tourism, domestic industrial use, and also consequential post-harvest losses, not only because of uh, climatic changes, but also because of COVID-19 with a national confinement and even, I would say, global confinement. Many of us couldn't have access to our farm letting all those fresh produce to be ripened and even some may be decomposed and thus adding to the greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. And not only that, farmers faced major economic losses. We also have uh, disruptions in the dry and wet seasons that interfered in the crop growing cycles, thus disrupting the distribution of those fresh produce and slowing the access of those produce to consumers and again, major economic losses for planters. And of course, not to mention that with a rising temperature due to climate change, higher stress levels and death rates of livestock have been noticed. Even here in Mauritius, we have been facing the, the same issue. So this has contributed to a decreased productivity of our local livestock here. And of course, I would say one of the most uh, pertinent issues is the excessive use of fertilizer and pesticides uh, to restore a reasonable harvest against the harsh weather patterns that leads to poor biodiversity, major catch outflows because of the expensive uh, rates of those uh, fertilizers and pesticides. And uh, ultimately, it impacts heavily on the health of those consumers. Now, why do we have to, to, to make use of those fertilizers and pesticides? It's, it is because we as uh, farmers, many, I would say, uh, they tend to, they, they need to have a quick harvest. They need to, to generate uh, um, an outcome of the production. Otherwise, there would be no survival uh, issue for these uh, planters. So there is a need for them to engage in the purchase of the fertilizer. So this is what climate change is causing, in fact. And another thing is, uh, because of climate changes I mentioned earlier, there is disruptions in the crop growing cycles. So what's going to happen? We have to import food to meet the local demand for the fresh produce that have been damaged by the poor weather. And this, of course, will lead to high import bill, but also add up to the carbon footprint. But what we can do is we can scale positive pathways. So I've uh, mentioned about six uh, major pathways that we all can have a consensus on, which is transparency, including the uh, transparency in the information being delivered, be it by policymakers, scientists, planters, academics. So it is then that we will be able to drive concrete action plans. Now, we no longer talk about sustainable agriculture. It is agroecological farming. Agroecological, you conserve the environment, you, you cater for green practices in uh, the agricultural sector, but also we strive for societal well-being. And uh, thirdly, there would be to concentrate on circular food systems by minimizing food loss, food waste. We have climate resilient. We have a re-education. Re-education, why? Re-education comes here in two aspects because let's say of COVID-19 situation, for instance, farmers have to be re-educated about the new ways of doing production. They have to be uh, equipped and funded with uh, sanitary toolkits, having a mask, sanitary uh, hand sanitizers, etc. So they have a sanitary protocols that they need to abide. And there is another aspect, which is to re-educate them into, I would say, bio-organic or even now it's safe to say agroecological farming. So re-education is very important. 
And finally, we need to have policies. Now, for policies, we need the youth. We need to encourage the youth to enter the policies, to be part of the uh, discussion, discussion group. And in this way, we will be able to, I would say, convince the government in order to provide the required financial aids to rebrand the agricultural sector. And I would like to share with you now some of the uh, adaptation programs that we here in Mauritius we adopt as a small island developing state. So we are currently in, engaging aggressively, I would say, in agroecological farming that includes sheltered farming. We have also uh, aquaponic, organic cultivation and agrophotovoltaism. There is now an increased concentration of uh, on the production and sales of local uh, natural fertilizers that include fermented cow dung, urine, gram flour, sugar cane, and, uh, or even brown sugar, with decomposer as the main ingredients. And we are also producing our own herbal pest repellents that constitute mainly on neem oil, but we also have some consisting of chili paste, garlic paste. So we are trying to source out all the raw materials that are available locally, because we, we have learned a lesson with the COVID-19 that we need to be able to produce our own food. And this taken into consideration, the soil health, of course, it is, it is not going to have any a negative impact on the soil biodiversity. In fact, it is going to enhance it. So other aspect is uh, we are involved in sensitizing the local communities on sustainable agriculture. We are doing workshops and also providing free compost bins. There is also free training on agroecological practices. And we are also engaged in developing local seed banks to produce local fruits and vegetables now that are more resistant to the prevailing climatic conditions. We have also established a food processing unit here to train at, at low cost the aspiring SMEs. And also there is allocation of funding by the government and private officials to NGOs for engaging in food processing project by using the rejected farm produce. And we target mainly vulnerable families and women. And also, you know, because of competition of uh, for water and increased salinization uh, problems in the soil. So we are adopting a more automated irrigation system, such as we have the drip irrigation, which is being implemented. So I want to share some, uh, with you uh, some of the uh, snapshots of agrophotovoltaism. So the, it is a photovoltaic panels at the top uh, of a greenhouse, and it has a very transparent layer beneath to allow that light to um, uh, enable photosynthesis of uh, crops. And below here, you will see in the picture on the right, it is not soil. It is in fact cow dung that has been mixed with, uh, you have sugar, just like I mentioned earlier. So this uh, substrate has been, uh, work, been worked on for the past three years. So we are practicing bio-organic farming here under this greenhouse. We have double income generated from this. One from the sale of electricity. Second is from the sale of organic produce. Now, on the government level here, of course, we uh, are in an era of, I would say, urbanization. We cannot break down the buildings. So what we can do is to adapt. We are engaging in smart cities, using uh, sustainable infrastructure and green energy. There is also a ban on plastic bags because that was a main issue of pollution in agri our agricultural fields. There is also funding from the EU uh, that has been directed to University of Mauritius and of agricultural institution to improve local food uh, research. And that is with a budget of 3 million euros to 4 million euros. Uh, for a reforestation program now, because it's we should not forget that forest is the largest and most important hub for um, restoring the biodiversity. So that is why here we are concentrating on that and we are growing cash trees, trees that's going to protect the environment, but as well will be a source of revenue. And there are also schemes for planters and breeders, especially for um, equipment to encourage bio farming. And now we are, will be introducing the organic bill that will encourage the, the planters to engage in organic practices through the participatory warranty system certification. And here also it will have a positive uh, effect on our soil and also will boost up the organic market. Another uh, 
uh, strategies being introduced by the government is the zero budget natural farming, which mimics nature, I would say. So it focuses a lot on uh, um, upscaling the content of the microorganisms in our soil. And of course, the advantage will be increasing crop yield, the quality would be increased, but also uh, what it is going to, uh, to help is that it's going to decrease the production cost of many farmers that we are currently facing with uh, the importation of uh, some biofertilizers and uh, pesticides. And that concept was introduced by Dr. Subhash Paligo, which is a naturalist from India. Other uh, research trials in progress include the conversion of livestock emission into biogas. And uh, here in Mauritius, we produce our own electricity. We do not do any importation whatsoever. So the bagasse from the sugarcane fields, because sugarcane cultivation is in fact our USP. So they are being converted into electrical energy to power all the domestic infrastructures here in Mauritius, being the household or big companies. And uh, now we as uh, farmers or the agrarian sector, they need to move on with uh, innovation and technology. So what we are doing here is uh, we have developed a centralized digital land bank of state and private agricultural land. Uh, why? Because we want to decrease that uh, uh, paperwork or bureaucratic approach of many agricultural institutions in trying to register planters or to, to when we have to do research work, we have difficulties in obtaining statistics. So here with the centralized digital bank, not only it will uh, provide a clearer platform for aspiring SME to register because it is uh, at low cost also. So it will, it's a very attractive scheme for the youth as well, but also it's going to provide clarity for the government how many planters are engaged uh, in which type of farming, because all th these uh, details will be included in their electronic data management system. So whether they are doing open field, sheltered farming or nursery production, livestock, then we will be able to provide conducive policies or even schemes that will assist those farmers in engaging in more, I would say, agroecological approach. This uh, restoring here, our focus, as mentioned earlier, the soil health. So some of my final comments would be that cooperation between academia, scientists, policymakers, and civil society has never been so important than ever before in terms of adversity. Such people to people exchange is very crucial to realize feasible actions that contribute to soil health, human health, and planet health. Before I end, I would like just to mention that from the past experience that we've got in conducting the National uh, UN Food System Summit Dialogue here in Mauritius. So we've seen that the one major issue is financial instruments. If we are able to have the necessary financial aids, it is only then that we will be able to recalibrate the people's mind to engage in organic farming, in soil restoration program, in more, um, I would say, smart agriculture. Only then that we'll be able to progress. So that is uh, a point that I wanted to focus. So thank you for your attention and I shall welcome any questions later at the end of this uh, session. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Kushbu. That was a very interesting presentation. I, I, I learned a lot from that one as well. So thank you for joining us. Um, yes, a couple of questions certainly come, come to mind from my end, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get to those in a, in a, in a little bit here. So our, our, our final panelist uh, today is uh, uh, Dr. Jim uh, Barnhart. Uh, Jim is the assistant to the administrator uh, at the, the U.S. Agency for International Development's Bureau for Resilience and uh, Food Security. Incidentally, I should say my former employer, uh, as well as the deputy coordinator for development for the uh, Feed the Future initiative, uh, the U.S. government's global hunger and food security initiative. Uh, Jim's previ uh, previously uh, served as mission director uh, for USAID missions in Jordan, Albania, uh, in Lebanon, uh, as well as uh, postings in, in Zambia and uh, Pakistan. So uh, with that, Jim, uh, over, over to you. Thank you, John. And um, 
let me express my appreciation for the, this event. I, I, like you, John, I've already learned a lot. It was great listening to to Julia, to to Rotan, of course, is always is always illuminating. And then and Tony's um, deep dive onto the, uh, the soil health, and then hearing uh, Kuspu bring us back to the reality of, of, of life on the ground for smallholders and the, the needs that they face, but also the hope. I think that that groups like um, Crop Life and and us all working together can can tackle global poverty, hunger, and malnutrition while addressing climate change. USAID for 60 years now has been a world leader in agriculture innovation. You know, not only do we research or support research and, and innovation in dozens of areas, but we've also sought to build capacity for international and local international institutions. And th this research has been a game changer for smallholder farmers around the world. One of the most important avenues for research is the agriculture, the International Agriculture Research Centers or the CGIAR um, network that we have supported from its very beginning as, as founding members. Uh, CGIAR has been critical uh, in preventing famines and improving livelihoods throughout the world. And, and USAID has partnered with them and have been a proud partner. We're also partnering with US universities with our innovation labs. We have a network of over 21 labs that support more than 70 US colleges and universities. And, and focusing on developing research and education well, uh, innovations and opportunities, both um, in the US, but also with a primary focus on building partnerships overseas. Now with all of this, the private sector plays a critical role as both a research partner and a beneficiary for these innovation labs and CG work. And we're, the key for us is trying to make sure there's, there's strong linkages between the research we're supporting and then um, getting those adapted at scale uh, around the world. Now, in other instances, we've been able to create direct partnerships around specific innovations, including with private companies and programs like our Partnering for Innovation activity. Agriculture innovation is supported directly by our missions also around the world. It, and it's through these offices that we support local businesses, policymakers, and smallholder farmers and make it happen on the ground. But as we all know, the, the progress is increasingly under threat from climate shocks and other stresses. And after decades of substantial progress, the number of hungry and malnutrition, malnourished people is trending in the wrong direction. And the US government recognizes this and understands that we must mobilize to reverse the trend. And I think Kuspu at the end of her, her, her um, presentation emphasized the importance of the financing angle. So the private sector is critical to our success Local private companies understand the economic, political, and social context of the countries where we work. International co companies in particular bring technology and institutional resources to scale um, these agricultural innovations and reach a far greater numbers of, of beneficiaries, often in partnerships with us either in Washington or in, our, in the field or with our other development partners. And since 2010, these partnerships have had a very successful track record. Thus far, uh, Feed the Future has lifted more than 23 million people out of poverty and hunger. And most recently, data from the World Bank supports this approach. They found that households living in Feed the Future program areas in Uganda and Malawi were more resilient to economic impacts of COVID-19 than similar placed households out, outside of areas where we were working. So to build on that success, this past September, President Biden announced a $5 billion, $5 billion multi-year commitment to feed the future over the next five years. The funding will support cutting edge research, boost economic and climate resilience for thousands of communities and help generate billions of dollars in new sales in the agriculture and food system. We're also greatly energized by the new US global food security strategy, which has launched which was launched last month by our USAID administrator, Samantha Power. The strategy highlights how USAID will respond to the new challenges we face, uh, while also advancing scientific research, prioritizing locally led development and advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. So to make all of these programs concrete, let me cite a few examples of the work we do. First, the Partnering for Innovation program, which I mentioned earlier, supported the development of um, CoolBot, 
um, by a company called Store Coal. And it's a low cost alternative to traditional refrigeration in Central America, which has often been too expensive for exporters who source from smallholder farmers. Also partnering for innovation supported ATEC, A-T-E-C, a Cambodian company that manufactures a biodigester that produces biogas for cooking and high quality organic fertilizer. Another example, and through our Feed the Future Innovation Labs, we supported rapid research for a maize disease response in East Africa. In 2014 to 2015, that disease threatened to cut maize yields significantly. But through our research and partners, we distributed a disease tolerant strain of maize that was quickly adopted by local seed companies. So USAID missions in Kenya, Tanzania, Nigeria, Zambia, and Bangladesh work with private companies like Corteva um, AgroSciences, which is a CropLife member and, and uh, a, a company that I happened to have the, the opportunity to visit at last month's um, World Food Prize event. Um, fascinating and, and to get a sense of the, the scale and scope and opportunity of working with companies like, like Corteva. So um, Corteva applies high-performing genetics to seeds, fertilizer, and crop protection, helping farmers maximize the value of their investments. And of course, innovations don't just involve research. USAID partners with companies like Keurig, Dr. Pepper, and Neumann Coffee to bring new approaches to getting finance to farmers to help them bring more resilient, to being more resilient and adapt sh to shocks like COVID and climate change. In addition, we've supported the development of low cost solar dryers for fruits and vegetables and new technologies to test food moisture content before storage. So that's what we've done and what we continue to do. Now, going forward, we continue to look for new ways to address climate, the climate crisis in collaboration with private sector partners. President Biden just announced two new programs in Glasgow last week as part of, as part of the US government's um, PREPARE climate framework. PREPARE is an acronym for the President's Emergency Plan for Adaptation and Resilience and is a whole of government, meaning all of the US government and then focus both domestically and internationally, but it brings all of the US government's benefit, uh, uh, resources to bear to support developing countries adapt and manage the impacts of climate change. USAID is central to prepare and, has, and we've made several commitments to advance the initiative, which will support more than half a billion people in developing countries to adapt and manage the impacts of climate change through locally led development by 2030. And one of the activities on the horizon that will support prepare objectives, as well as mitigation efforts, is called the Green Recovery Investment Platform, or GRIP. GRIP will invest up to $250 million to mobilize $2.5 billion of private financing for adaptation and mitigation by 2027. And it's going to be doing that by creating incentives and reducing risk for large scale private investment to address the climate finance gap. You know, more than 90 organizations, including private sector companies, have provided feedback on GRIP. And we at USAID are now working to incorporate that feedback into the final scope of work. You know, second, USAID is proud to partner with USDA and the State Department on the Aim for Climate, the Agriculture Innovation Mission for the Climate. And Julia spoke about that earlier, and it's absolutely um, thrilling to have um, CropLife as a valuable partner in the aim for C work. And so in addition to CropLife, we have over 33 governments and private sector companies that are signing up. Finally, to improve our ability to work with the private sector, uh, our administrator, Samantha Power, announced a new flexible fund devoted to working with private companies. The aim of this centralized flexible fund is to allow USA to move quickly when big partnership opportunities arise as well as when we pro proactively seek them out. All of these initiatives and more will greatly increase our ability to partner with the private sector, address new challenges, and reach those most vulnerable to climate change at scale. So John, thank you for the opportunity to, to join today, and I'm looking forward to answering yours and others' questions. Great, thanks, Jim. Thanks for the uh, your remarks and, and giving us the, some kind of very tangible, specific uh, examples. I think that certainly certainly helps to to understand what we're talking about here. 
Uh, so can we uh, throw us uh, all on the screen here? Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so uh, again, just for uh, participants in the audience, please uh, feel free to um, you know pop some questions in the in the comment uh, side there. I have a, a couple already that have come in through this comment board and uh, I believe the comment board in 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 the sort of main ICC um, fora. Uh, so the first one it, it looks like is uh, mostly directed at you, um, uh, Tony, as you're talking about this uh, this investment gap. Um, Around around soil, um, the question is, uh, you know, as a young entrepreneur, this is from Ben King. Um, how do we access um, resources of these large organizations um, for innovation, and how do we work with these large ag companies to to integrate the solutions that we we may have? <clears throat> yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, so, one of the things which we've recognized um, in our work has been that. <clears throat> this can't just be about you know very large multinationals making these types of investments. We have to find ways to um, accommodate the roles of you know, innovations and small and medium enterprises across the board um, for this. So one of the things that we've developed um, along with support from um, the International Fund on Agricultural Development along with other partners um, is a small and medium enterprises digital finance platform. Um, I can share the link um, actually in the chat with people so that maybe that can be posted and you can have a look. But the aim of that is to sort of very much open up the investment so that um, if you're a small agripreneur um, and you're looking for funds um, to help your business, um, that you can also go to um, some of these bigger funds to try and do that. And that's the absolute role of that platform is to connect the supply with the demand. So um, it's a really critical need. Um, and it's particularly important in uh, developing agricultural settings where a lot of business businesses are at that size. And um, so, yeah, we're, we're sort of quite excited about where that can go. And we believe that it has huge potential in agricultural settings across um, sub-Saharan Africa. We think the Great Green Wall, which is uh, this huge, amazing 12,000 mile um, project across the Sahel, um, it should, should be a uh, focus area along with um, parts of um, India. Um, and the Indian subcontinent. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll share that and uh, hope that that can help uh, help you make some some more progress in the space. Thanks, Tony. Um, next uh, next question uh, is is uh, for you, Kushbu. Maybe 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 a two part question for you. Um, First, uh, I think um, sort of from my end, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the about the the WFO um, gymnasium program and sort of how that works and, and how that elevates farmer voices. Uh, and the and this and the second question is, um, I mean, you 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 gave us um, sort of the, where the rubber hits the road kind of presentation about you know finding you know flexible solutions that that work in very local contexts uh in in particularly in the face of uh, an unexpected global shock around covid uh, it feels like it's a long way from a lot of the the global conversations that happen at these big multilateral meetings i, I wonder from your perspective you know what what is what is valuable at the local and regional level to come out of some of these international discussions? I know you, you talked about financing, but if there's anything else that you want to offer up as sort of what what would be valuable in in, in supporting sort of local solutions? So I guess uh, two questions for you, Kushbu. Thank you, John, uh, for your questions. Uh, Firstly, the World Farmers uh, Organization Gymnasium program here, it's about uh, developing your leadership muscles. That is why it is called Gymnasium. And it is a platform that provides uh, young farmers all around the world uh, to be able to voice out their queries, their um, solutions that they want to propose to rebrand, I would say, the farming sector with touch of uh, innovation, we have uh, technology, but also taking um, the traditional, I would say, cultures of farming as well, because we should not uh, forget that our ancestors have been doing a great job in the farming uh, sector. It's only because of certain, I would say, uh, abuse of certain products that we are here today facing, I would say, solid degradation, for instance. 
that is uh, one point that I wanted to bring out. And yes, uh, the other aspect of, uh, I would say, other benefit that the gymnasium program provides is connecting us to important platforms, just like today uh, in this platform, where I am representing, I would say, the young farmers from the gymnasium program and also providing some of the common uh, ideas that we as uh, young farmers think uh, or would say is uh, present here as a reality, some of those actions that needs to be taken. Now uh, for your uh, second question on uh, the one specific action that I think that would be impactful, let's say from all the uh, discussions from the COPE, from the UN Food System Summit, so just I've mentioned the prime factor would be financial instrument. But if we are taking on board a second factor here, it would be mainly, I would say, sensitization or even let's be more specific in terms of there is a need of recalibrating the people's mind. We have to find the tools. The tools can be can be again stem back to the uh, financial instrument because all these uh, whether it's workshop whether it's awareness campaign or even if we want to dive into technology we need resources even if we want to to organize workshops with uh, the inclusion of the government parties we need funding so how are we going to get that yes there is for uh, private sectors but private sectors maybe they have other uh, priorities so we have to be able to manage on our own so that is uh, one thing that uh, we as uh, youth here in Mauritius we are doing we're forming groups uh, of uh, young farmers we are making uh, I would say a powerful team together we are I would say going on fields going on on, on site to, to to tell uh, to to make the government aware of our challenges if not uh, uh, the financial instruments, then the media is going to help us. So mm -hmm. we are always trying to find ways to make our voices heard. So I think one of the important aspects here in the bit, uh, in the UN Food System Summit or even in the COP, we have to engage the youth. It's very important. So youth uh, involvement here is, uh, youth engagement, I would say, is critical to mm -hmm. convert many of those I would I would not, I won't say speeches but discussions into concrete actions. So mm -hmm. that is uh, my point of view. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that that makes uh, that makes good sense. Certainly, on sort of ele elevating some of that uh, that messaging to to sort of shift that that thinking a bit. So so thank you for that. Um, uh, next. Uh, Next question here is uh, is is for you, Jim. Um, just the the previous uh, you know presentations, uh, certainly from Tony and, and Dr. Law, really focused on on the again on the on the soil part of the equation. Again, thinking about Dr. Law's long equation there at the end. Um, I, I wonder uh, you gave some examples, but uh, you know, has the sort of soil health and, and soil carbon been been part of the Kind of investment uh, focus for for USAID uh, around climate. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, John. And, and indeed, it has um, over the last several years. USAID has has worked with a, no, a number of institutions, uh, including the International Fertilizer Development Center (IFDC), number of U.S. universities, um, the international research centers. Um, we we brought together a, a group of those, that group of institutions to create what we call the soils. Consortium, which is a great acronym, um, it actually makes sense. It stands for Sustainable Opportunities and in Increasing Livelihoods with Soils. So it is all focused on soils. And the, we think of it as a multidisciplinary effort. It's to enhance the soil health and fertility of smallholder farms in Africa. Um, and the particular focus on um, increasing resilience to, to climate change and uh, addressing the, the soil carbon storage potential, as, as Dr. Lal referenced in his, in his presentation. So through the consortium, we're, we are planning on having a, an African Union Soil Health Summit 
in 2022. Hopefully it will be in person, but if not, I, I guess we can also continue to use this venue. It's great. Um, but that'll happen in 2022 to continue to accelerate our work and, and focus on soil health. So back to you. Thanks. Thanks for the examples, Jim. Um, next one uh, here, uh, question, may, maybe uh, going back to you, uh, Tony. Um, I mean, I think you, you you talked a little bit about this in your remarks about, uh, you know, the need for sort of, you know, soil characterization um, as sort of a key element here. Um, you know, my own understanding is that, you know, still one of the, the challenges about, um, you know, on, on sort of soil health and, and soil as a as a real kind of fungible asset are those um, you know, are, are sort of the the tools on those and the tools and the and the ways for quantifying those benefits, sort of the measurement approaches and the uh, the reliability of those things. Is is that accurate and is that changing? You know, do we have reliable ways to really really um, put our finger on what's happening at the soil level for the types of uh, investment uh, pieces you talked about? Yeah, it's it's definitely at the forefront of what a lot of the companies that we speak to about this is. So, I mean, if you just take the example, I mean, first thing I would say is that soil health is about all of the dimensions of soil health, right? It's climate change, biodiversity, resilience, um, productivity, livelihoods. Um, if you zoom in to the piece just on soil carbon, where there's been a huge amount of interest, then one of the challenges with things like soil carbon markets is that the cost of verification at the moment and the technologies um, and methods needed to verify that level of soil carbon um, is so high that it's almost um, it, it, it's it's too high to make it profitable from a kind of carbon generation perspective because the price of carbon is still too low on the market. Um, and so we really need. So the example of that would be that many of the companies work with, they have to soil, they have to test their soil directly in all of the land where these uh, schemes are in place. Uh, they have to send that to a lab. They have to get it processed manually. And it, that all costs money and takes time. And it really is one of the biggest blocker to scaling some of these solutions. Um, and so I think the role in this monitoring um, and verification of remote sensing technologies um, is going to be really important going forwards. And, you know, if you look at the IBMs and other big tech companies of this world, they have the most remarkable uh, satellites that can monitor, um, you know, gas spectroscopy and, and all sorts of things to know exactly what's going on on the ground. And so I, I think over time we'll be able to move those technologies, which are sort of being piloted and low level satellites and stuff like that to actually do some of this MRV. The question is, how do we get that integrated into the standards? Mm -hmm. um, and then indeed, how do we look more broadly, not just at carbon, um, but at the health of the soil and the quality that's there and have better ways to, to test and monitor it. Um, the Ethiopian soil information system, which was put together by the Ethiopian government over the last 10 years is a really good example of soil mapping that has to take place because once you've got a proper soil map, you can keep it updated and then you can uh, apply the right agricultural solutions to those areas um, that need it. And those farmers that need particular blended fertilizers, for example, um, or indeed conservation soil practices um, in the right way and be much more targeted. So I think like in the long term, those technologies are going to play a vital role. And I think all companies and partners on this have, have got a role to say, how do we reach out to the tech companies to do that? Um, and do that in a, again in an equitable way so that the data which is shared is something that farmers feel they can understand and trust and, and so on. So uh, definitely a big question and a, a big kind of frontier of, of development right now. Scientists in the UN Food System Summit are talking about you know, how do we verify soil health. I think that would be a really, really important area of public sector development too in the coming years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that, that, makes, that makes good sense, Tony. Thanks for that. That, that actually... Um... Yeah, that's very that's very clear. Um, am I on? Not on mute. Okay, just checking. I wasn't on mute here. Um, I just wanted to answer uh, really quickly. There was a, a question in the um, on the chat um, that was uh, directed at at Julia and me. So I will take the thirty second moderator uh, prerogative to answer the question about um, regenerative soil science and regenerative agriculture. You know, I think, um, you know, our, our position on, on regenerative agriculture is, you know, similar to our position kind of generally about, about, you know, sustainable food systems and that we are, you know, 
fully support those those outcome uh, goals that we want to achieve around um, regenerative agriculture, you know, in in you know improved soil health, biodiversity, water quality, and and having those uh, having those systems that 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 are regenerative. I think that some of the questions still out there is that there's not really a, a broadly agreed upon definition and you know things things get more more challenging when there's sort of um prescriptive and, and, and ideological pieces that are that are put up front that, that aren't sort of focused on those kinds of of outputs that we're all trying to uh achieve so just at a high level very very supportive of of that that topic um but but certainly um you know engaging in the conversation about sort of that that definition and and the pieces that that go um that go into achieving those those outcomes so thank you for indulging the the moderator's prerogative there uh last question we're we're running short on time here but um the the you know the reason for this uh you know this session from from ICC um you know is is certainly on the margins of the the COP26 meeting um so you know i wanted to to sort of end um and say that you know we, there's an certainly from uh, those following this online there's there's an overwhelming number of announcements commitments pledges etc that have come um from the ongoing cop26 meetings and and before that the the food system summit and the uh, and the biodiversity cop it's you know frankly it's it's hard to keep those it's hard to keep them them all straight so maybe if we could just close and, and go around the the panel here and, and and if you could share maybe what you think would be the most impactful one of those um, announcements, commitments, et cetera, coming out of these this COP and Food Systems Summit. I think that would be an interesting thing for, for the audience to hear. So um, maybe uh, do we want to uh, start? How about we start with you, Jim, um, if you have any uh, thoughts on on that? <clears throat> Well, I, I, I love that, John. I, I, I've been tracking and been involved in all of these events for the last few, last, what, I guess it's been the last two to three months. And I agree with you that they have been coming at us at a dizzying pace. But look, there's so much that's come out of COP, so much that came out of the Food Systems Summit, um, lots of commitments and energy. Um, I, so it's hard to pick any one, but I, I think we are get generating global momentum toward addressing solutions, right? And so I, I think this, just like this panel here, this idea of bringing together governments, private sector, civil society, and, and the most marginalized populations on the planet in, involved in this conversation is, is really important. And so now we've got to take it to scale. I'm, you know, from a U.S. government perspective, I'm particularly please would prepare, you know, the, that president's emergency plan. What it's going to do, John, is it's going to help us do what needs to happen, which is go quickly from talking to implementation and working closely with the field. Um, we've signed on to the, as USA, the principles of locally led adaptation, which means we need to try to get resources as quickly as possible to our partners, um, communities, smallholder farmers uh, uh, around the world. And so that's I think monitoring that, tracking how we do as, as, as development partners, and I look to Kuspu who said earlier, this importance of getting financing to the field, to the farmers is really critical. So we've fallen behind, way behind on in terms of commitments for climate adaptation. I think this um, last couple of weeks, hopefully has elevated adaptation to a place where we might be starting to at least somewhat balance both public and private sector investment on, on the adaptation front. Let me pause there. Excellent. Great, Jim. Uh, Kushbu, why don't we turn to you uh, next for any any uh, any thoughts? <clears throat> yes. So, as uh, Jim mentioned, so there is uh, a need to strengthen that cooperation between the private sector, public sector, and um, also the third parties organization. We should not forget about them because uh, they are uh, doing a great job, I would say, on site in uh, trying to uh, boost up those uh, awareness campaign uh, revolving around the meat agroecological farming or uh, I would say food processing, for instance. So what I wanted to share that uh, I think and I, I hope that uh, this uh, from this scope, at least we are able to convert some of those uh, green ideas 
uh, or even um, solutions that have been proposed for a better future for our youth, for the younger generation would be put into practice. So if not all, but we need to have a, a, a starting point. It needs to, to be into concrete actions. So that is uh, one of the expectations that I think many of us uh, is having in terms of uh, uh, those um, practices that would help to build better, uh, I would say, a farming sector and even more um, policies and um, I would say schemes that would be available for not only the big uh, farmers but also smallholder farmers in striving towards their um, survival in terms of uh, the local food production and also to be able to produce at a larger scale uh, our own food but keeping in mind the uh, climate change and also innovation and technology yes excellent no, that's a great response, and, and certainly thank you for all uh, that, that you are doing that we heard today, um, Kushbu. It sounds like it's uh, it's great work. Um, Tony, I guess you, you get the, the last word here, um, so maybe over to you. <laughs> well, I think only building on um, what the other um, brilliant speakers have said before me, really, um, I think we're definitely seeing some momentum and progress um, more broadly from this COP. Um, I think that uh, the role of farmers is becoming ever more central, which is good and important to see. Um, I think we, you know, kind of going forwards, I guess a few things like, um, I mean, just the first one is just the other cops, you know, we can't forget about them. In 1992, we had three conventions. We had the Convention on Climate Change, but we had the Convention on Biological Diversity and the one on desertification too. And we have to play play strongly into those conventions to get the solutions on agri um, soil health solutions going. Article six under the uh, UNFCCC is vitally important. It's highly frustrating to me as a global citizen that this hasn't been clarified because I really believe this would help uh, bring in the role of um, carbon markets in a more regulated fashion to actually help us have better solutions to meet NDCs through tradable credits rather than just kind of individual country level um, uh, commitments. That said, at least we have some roles from the voluntary private uh, voluntary market, which is helping. The last thing I'd say that I think would be really important is I think strengthen science for 1.5 degree pathways for the agriculture and food sector would be hugely helpful. We're starting to see this in the form of pledges on methane deforestation by countries um, that give real clarity uh, to how that would translate to the ground in um, you know, areas of the world where those um, factors are big issues. Um, and I think they're gonna play increasingly important roles and mean that businesses can then say, okay, well, if there's a 1.5 degree pathway for soy or for beef or for dairy which we are starting to see the development of you can actually tactically know if what you're doing is truly going to meet a 1.5 degree commitment by 2050 so i think there's some really interesting science coming out of the space that we should watch um the, to, that will help us along but um yeah otherwise super excited for the future and 2022 is going to bring us stockholm plus 50 uh, 50 years after the uh, the convention in 1972. So I hope that we can continue to remember that all of these are enshrining us towards progress. Yes, yes, that's a that's a great great part to, to conclude on. Hopefully, we are you know we are we are uh, seeing progress and um, we can hopefully keep going that direction. So um, wonderful. Well, uh, well, I would like to certainly thank all of our our panelists and attendees for for participating today. I think it's been a, certainly an interesting conversation. As I said before, I, I've learned a lot, and hopefully some 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 tools and messages for for um, all of us to to take away as we we keep elevating the conversation about agriculture and innovation as part of this this climate discussion. So, uh, with that, I will I will say thank you to everyone for joining, and uh, we will. Uh, certainly all stay in, in touch and working together. So, so signing off, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.